When Atlanta hosted the Olympics in 1996, the National Weather Service collected detailed data on the region's weather in order to predict conditions for the competing athletes. Scientists studying the data saw that urban Atlanta was consistently warmer than surrounding rural areas, especially at night. They also noticed something else. Sprawling metro Atlanta and areas downwind of Atlanta actually got different amounts of rain and more intense storms than the countryside surrounding them. What they were seeing was the impact of the urban heat island effect. Heat islands form as vegetation is replaced by asphalt and concrete for roads, buildings, and other structures built to accommodate growing populations. Those surfaces absorb, rather than reflect, the sun's heat, causing surface temperatures and overall ambient temperatures to rise. The result? More heat and more air pollution over cities and suburban areas than the surrounding countryside. The impact of this urban heat island varies by city. Local topography, native vegetation, weather, and geographic location can enhance or inhibit the heat island effect. The effect was so large and noticeable in Atlanta because the fast-growing region had been converting an average of 55 acres of trees per day to roads, parking lots, and rooftops. Let's take a closer look at specific causes of the urban heat island, how the urban heat island impacts our quality of life, and what your viewers can do to dampen the urban heat island. Walk down a city street on a summer afternoon, and you'll often see sweltering waves of heat coming off the pavement and buildings. It's no coincidence that you wouldn't see this walking down an unpaved country lane. The urban heat island gains much of its heat from the constructed surfaces inside cities. As our cities grow and our dependence on the automobile increases urban sprawl, we are continually replacing natural ground cover with man-made materials. These materials, such as concrete, asphalt, and roofing shingles, have a very different effect on the way heat is exchanged between the Earth's surface and the atmosphere. The difference starts with the reflective properties of built materials. The percentage of solar energy reflected from a material's surface is known as its albedo. The lower the albedo, the less radiation is reflected by the material. The albedo of commonly found surface materials varies widely, but is very low for many of the surfaces found in cities and towns. Asphalt and tar roofing materials are poor reflectors of radiation. They have a very low albedo. Urban materials also differ from undeveloped land in their thermal properties, such as density, specific heat, heat capacity, and thermal conductivity. These thermal properties allow them to absorb and store heat better than living ground cover. Once absorbed, this stored energy is slowly released as heat to the surrounding environment. The combination of lower reflectance and better heat storage construction materials in cities means more heat is captured and released into urban environments. The effect is noticeable at night when paved surfaces radiate heat long after sunset. Since two-thirds of many metropolitan areas are paved or covered by buildings, cities thus contain a much larger reservoir of stored energy and warm surfaces than surrounding farmlands and forests. The urban heat island isn't caused exclusively by building materials. City layout is also a factor. At night, tall, warm buildings block the view from the ground to the colder sky, inhibiting cooling during a time when an open field would lose much of its energy to the atmosphere. Tall buildings also block wind, which might otherwise sweep heat away. Local weather, climate, and topology can also promote or inhibit the effect. Ah, the shade of a tree on a hot afternoon. The shade trees provide is a significant source of cooling, and the scarcity of trees in city centers promotes the urban heat island effect. But trees don't just provide a respite from the sun's rays. They also breathe out water vapor through a process called transpiration, which helps cool the surrounding air through evaporative cooling. Transpiration's contribution to the water vapor in the atmosphere and its corresponding cooling power is not trivial. Studies have shown that it accounts for a good 10% of atmospheric water vapor, the rest coming from evaporation of water directly from soil and water bodies. It has been estimated that over the growing season, one acre of corn plants may transpire 400,000 gallons of water. In liquid form, the water would cover the field with a lake 15 inches deep. 
a large oak tree alone can transpire 40,000 gallons of water per year. Plants aren't the only natural feature that provides built-in cooling. Water also evaporates from the soil or bodies of water, serving as natural air conditioning. The built environment usually has less surface water and free soil than outlying rural environments, and so less evaporative cooling. Look around any urban area, and it's not hard to spot sources of heat and exhaust. They are byproducts of the combustion engines that drive transportation and industry. Add to that heat given off by the air conditioning systems we use to cool our homes and office buildings, and there is an abundance of waste energy routinely pumped into the urban atmosphere. Each individual source of heat, whether a car, an air conditioning unit, or a small factory, may not be a significant contributor, but thousands of sources make an impact. A study of Tokyo, Japan in 1995 concluded that the waste heat from the city's downtown district alone raised nighttime temperatures by 5 degrees Fahrenheit. The effects of the urban heat island are most noticeable at night and during times of high pressure, light winds, and clear skies. In the sun's absence, the stored energy in the concrete and asphalt is released as long-wave radiation. Man-made sources of heat also contribute to warming the urban boundary layer. This is more noticeable during the longer, colder winter nights. The presence of the urban heat island affects the climate of an urban area. It certainly raises average temperatures. In some cities, it also causes more haze and fog. The urban boundary layer tends to trap small particles, or particulates. When relative humidity levels reach 70 plus percent, water vapor condenses on these particles, forming haze or fog. The urban heat island has also been shown to increase precipitation in areas just downwind from a city center. The built environment provides surface roughness to slow oncoming winds. The warm surfaces in the urban heat island create an area of low pressure. The combined effect is an area of convergence above the urban area. Add to this an increase in the concentration of cloud-forming particles, and it leads to an associated increase in clouds and precipitation in the downwind areas of the urban boundary layer. In 2006, the American Lung Association reported that over 150 million people live in U.S. counties that regularly have unhealthy levels of smog or particle pollution. With more than 20 million Americans suffering from asthma and another 12 million suffering from chronic obstructive lung disease, there is little question that air pollution is a serious concern in many urban areas. As with water, the EPA has led efforts to regulate air pollution. The original Clean Air Act of 1963 has been amended several times to more effectively tackle the issue. Yet despite EPA's best efforts, our dependence on combustion engines in transportation, our reliance on coal to power our electric plants, and our use of heating oil to fire home furnaces all contribute to the problem. And in certain weather conditions, low wind speed, high stability, and shallow mixing depth conditions can quickly become unhealthy. In addition to the health risks posed by many air pollutants, greenhouse gas emissions are increasingly affecting our climate. Though climate change is not a focus here, regulations and activities that reduce air pollution also reduce greenhouse gas emissions.